Section 19 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 19. The Field Spaniel by J. F. Kirk. The Field Spaniel is the modern name given to the larger breed of land spaniels or springers to distinguish them from water spaniels and the smaller land spaniel or cocker. The name is not especially happy as to choice inasmuch as his work is principally confined to cover shooting, where he is particularly useful in finding and raising or springing the woodcock, partridge, or pheasant and his raison d'etre and popularity consist in his special excellence and adaptability for such work. In the English Kennel Club stud book, under the head of field spaniels, are included springers and cockers, except such as have special classes assigned to them, that is, clumbers and Sussex spaniels. Thus there are many varieties having distinct and separate characteristics admitted and recognized under the comprehensive cognomen of field spaniel but the intention of scope of this article is to treat of that most popular and handsome variety known as the black spaniel before going into the points and qualities of this engaging and beautiful breed a short glance into his history and elements will enable the reader to trace the fact that he is at present displayed on our show benches to the admiration of all lovers of sporting dogs. He is of comparatively modern origin. A stupid prejudice, as it seems to the writer, exists in the minds of many worthy old sportsmen that deterioration is the most evident fact to them in comparing modern spaniels with the wonderful dogs of their day. This is pure nonsense and arises from a kind of halo of glory which we are all apt to surround the memories of our young and enthusiastic days. From personal recollection and good opportunities of comparison extending over nearly forty years, I feel positive that the handsome setters which old Laverack used to bring with him to any native Highland moors would not receive more than a VHC card at our modern shows. And so with Spaniels. The dogs of thirty or even fifteen years ago cannot be compared with the cracks of the present day. In candidly admitting this fact, however, I am quite free to confess that there is a strong tendency on the part of modern breeders to exaggerate fancy points, and as a consequence an undue appreciation is apt to be given in the cultivation of the different breeds to abnormal excess in the admired and difficult-to-be-obtained qualities that differentiate each class from its kindred and allied breed, sometimes at the expense of more useful characteristics. For instance, spaniel conformation is essentially long and low, and this has created a rivalry amongst breeders to produce the longest and lowest. Now there is a limit to the length and lowness which is clearly defined as a point where an exaggeration in those respects interferes with the necessary activity and ability to work with sufficient ease and vigor in a rough country. In England, the clumber, which is the longest, lowest, and heaviest of the spaniel tribe, is only particularly useful in pheasant preserves, where rides are cut through the cover and where strong, plodding dogs are required. In examining the old authorities, we find that there were numerous varieties of sporting spaniels and that each appears to have been selected and bred for the special peculiarities of game and shooting that prevailed in certain districts. In Sussex, the large and handsome golden liver breed was especially prized. In Wales and Devon, the smaller liver and liver and white cockers were especially suited par excellence for the sport in those countries, while farther north and in the Midland counties, the black and tan spaniels were the favorites. After the introduction of dog shows in England about 30 years ago, the blacks appear to have monopolized most attention and several breeders of historical renown succeeded in improving 
by judicious selection and crosses the very beautiful black spaniel till he fairly eclipsed all competitors for honors more recently a highly successful experiment of crossing him with the highly esteemed sussex breed has brought fame and funds as the result to the most intelligent and persevering breeders of the present day thus we see that the popular modern black spaniel is a product of judicious and skillful crossing of various breeds the rev w b daniel whose rural sports published during the first decade of the century ought to be in every sportsman's library being the work of a thorough connoisseur and keen critical observer a spaniel cannot be too strong a spaniel cannot be too short on the leg a spaniel cannot be too high couraged thus we see that extremely short heavy limbs are no modern innovation as some claim i am inclined to think however that if the good and reverend old gentleman lived in our day he would be inclined to cry quote, halt you've got them short enough in the leg and heavy enough in the bone and too many of your prize winners are too crooked and clumsy for any sporting purpose end quote and he would be right the modern tendency is to breed them too heavy in bone and body and consequently too heavy and unwieldy for use i refer of course to the english prize winners because on this side of the atlantic few indeed of this type have been seen our spaniels as seen on the show benches are generally absurdly wrong in the opposite direction a leggy spaniel is an abomination but we must come to a clear comprehension as to the line to be drawn between long legs and no legs. Now a short-legged dog, which every spaniel should be, does not mean of necessity a crawling thing that requires to be helped over every obstacle a foot or two high. I have seen a Sussex spaniel bitch, measuring only 15 inches full height at shoulder and 40 inches from tip of nose to set on of tail, able to get over a six-foot fence with ease and work a tubby-built 18-inch dog to a standstill in half a day's work. Why? Because she had grand supple shoulders, powerful loins and quarters, well-bent stifles and hocks, the possession of which gave her what fox terrier men call liberty, while he, though of greater muscular development and short-coupled, was tied and cloddy in action if with length of body and shortness of limb are combined freedom of shoulder action straight front legs and powerful sickle hocks and stifles with wide and muscular loins you have a dog surprisingly active for his inches idstone than whom no modern writer knew better what a spaniel should be speaks of the low long and strong spaniel now i insist on it that if your field spaniel has not this confirmation he cannot be called a good one the next distinguishing characteristic of a good specimen is his stamp of head including muzzle eyes ears and expression the general contour and profile of the face and skull should resemble the shape of a reduced gordon setter but with longer lower hanging and more heavily feathered ears darker eyes and rather clear-cut muzzle the faults to be avoided are heavy chumpy newfoundland heads high set on ears full eyes and throaty necks on the one hand and attenuated tapering muscles with shallow lips and flat narrow brainless skulls fishy eyes too light in color showing limited intelligence and uncertain temper on the other Good temper, intelligence, docility, and courage must be plainly indicated in the expression of the head and face. And a very important matter also is that the nose should be large, moist, and widespread, showing the possession of high capacity for keen scent. Another necessary mark of a good field spaniel is the coat. The flatter and straighter the coat lies to the body, the better, but it must not be thin and open and the heavily coated ones are often inclined to be wavy especially over the neck and rump it must be of good soft texture and very bright and glossy a harsher texture of coat 
is generally dull in color, but some very excellent Spaniels have rather strong hair, and this may be, as is by their owners contended, an indication of the strength of constitution. It is certainly quite becoming when brilliant and straight, but the tendency of such coats is to be scant and open. The feather should always be long and straight or slightly wavy, very heavy on ears, back of forelegs, under the belly, and behind the thighs, as well as between the toes, which gives the feet great protection. A great deal of interesting contention and discussion has periodically been occasioned by the interbreeding of Cockers and Springers, and I have been asked to give my opinion as to the line of distinction to be drawn between the field and the Cocker Spaniel. Well, the actual difference is mainly one of size and proportions, and also of temperament. Field Spaniels range from 28 to 45 pounds in weight. Some exceed this latter limit, but I think this is not desirable. Cocker Spaniels should weigh from 18 to 25 pounds, or as the standard defines, even 28 pounds. Field Spaniels should be proportionately lower heavier in bone, and generally slower and longer in body. Cocker Spaniels proportionately higher, but strong in muscle, more active, and cobbier in build. While both classes should display the essential characteristics of the sporting Spaniel, more dash and energy and general eagerness, which their more active build and smaller size indicate, are expected from the smaller breed and, on the other hand, a closer range, stricter obedience to signs and whistles, and the same diligence in work should be looked for in the larger and heavier breed. The cocker may be shorter in head and body, but should exhibit a well-formed muzzle, showing a well-developed nose and flues, with lips well pendant, and in both breeds the ears should be long in leather and with good feather, set low on the head, especially so with the larger breed. It is esteemed a point of beauty in field spaniels to have the peak of the occiput well marked and rising in a distinct point above the origin or highest set on of the ears, which must fall close to the head and hang flat to the cheek or side of the head. The height at shoulder of a 22-pound cocker should not exceed 12 inches, and 11 inches would be better. A 28-pound dog may go to 13 and a half inches, but not more. A field spaniel of 45 pounds should not exceed 15 inches at the shoulder, and a smaller one, say 35 pounds, should be 14 inches or less. Straight legs in front should be insisted on, especially in the cocker breed, but not to the extent that obtains in fox terriers. A narrow front is not desirable, and a good depth of chest and well-rounded barrel with ribs well developed toward the loins, which should be muscular and strong, are particularly required. The hind quarters should be muscular, and the first and second thighs and hocks well bent, and so arranged as to give vigorous spring to the movement. Cow hocks or hocks outturned are objectionable. The feet are of great importance and should be strong and well furnished with heavy, solid, thick pads, horny soles, and knuckles well sprung and held close together, not splay-footed or spreading. A pendant is the standard for the modern field spaniel or springer adopted by the American Spaniel Club with scale points for judging. Value head, 15. Legs and feet, 15. Ears, 10. Body and quarters, 20. Neck, 5. Coat and feather, 15. Shoulders and arms, 10. Tail, 10. Total, 100 points. General appearance. Considerably larger, heavier, and stronger in build than the cocker, the modern springer is more active and animated than the clumber, and has little of the sober sedateness characteristic of the latter. He should exhibit courage and determination in his carriage and action, as well as liveliness of temperament, though not in this respect, to the same restless degree generally possessed by the cocker. His conformation should be long and low, more so than the cocker. 
intelligence obedience and good nature should be strongly evident the colors most preferred are solid black or liver but liver and white black and white black and tan orange and orange and white are all legitimate spaniel colors head value fifteen long and not too wide elegant and shapely and carried gracefully skull showing clearly cut brows but without a very pronounced stop occupant distinct and rising considerably above the set on of the ears muzzle long with well-developed nose not too thick immediately in front of the eye and maintaining nearly the same breadth to the point sufficient flue to give a certain squareness to the muscle and avoid snippiness or wedginess of face teeth sound and regular eyes intelligent in expression and dark not showing the haw nor so large as to be prominent or goggle-eyed ears value ten should be long and hung low on the skull lobe shaped and covered with straight or slightly wavy silky feather neck value five long graceful and free from throatiness tapering toward the head not too thick but strongly set into shoulders and brisket shoulders and arms value ten the shoulder blades should lie obliquely and with sufficient looseness of attachment to give freedom to the forearms which should be well let down legs and feet value fifteen the fore legs should be straight very strong and short hind legs should be well bent at the stifle joint with plenty of muscular power feet should be of good size with thick well-developed pads not flat or spreading body and quarters value twenty long with well-sprung ribs strong slightly arching loins well coupled to the quarters which may droop slightly toward the stern coat and feather value fifteen the coat should be as straight and flat as possible silky in texture of sufficient denseness to afford good protection to the skin in thorny coverts and moderately long the feather should be long and ample straight or slightly wavy heavily fringing the ears back of the fore legs between the toes and on back quarters tail value ten should be strong and carried not higher than the level of the back end of section nineteen recording by tom mack